Good evening. Welcome to SAMS News Bite. I am Damien Obey, and making the headlines in this week's news, Ascension Flights announced VIP French visitors for Bicentenary, Fine Art at the Museum, Cancer Awareness Events brings community together, and highlights from this week's football. It has been several months since Kamiya became a household name on St. Helena when they were announced as the air service provider. The company burst into the headlines again last Friday when the governor announced they will also be flying a passenger plane to Ascension. The announcement was made at an event at Bertrand's Cottage. So I've got some additional good news to bring to you this afternoon. I think you all know by now that um, the very well regarded company Comair will provide a weekly air service between Johannesburg and St. Helena starting early next year. This afternoon, I'm delighted to be able to confirm that after a huge amount of effort and work by Ascension Island government colleagues and colleagues here on St. Helena, Comair has been selected as the preferred bidder for the provision of air services between Ascension and St. Helena. And it's anticipated that this proposed service will operate initially on a frequency of once every four weeks and for a trial period of one year. There's a lot more detailed discussion to be done with Comair over the coming weeks as we move ahead with formalising a service contract that meets the requirements of both islands. And then subject to those discussions and regulatory requirements being met, we'll make a more detailed announcement later on. But that for the saint community, and again, I was talking about doing things for the first time. Now we're talking about an air link between here and Ascension. That'll be a two-hour flight, roughly, instead of two nights on the ship. Um, And uh, again, things done for the first time. Massive achievement for a small community like this, uh, and yet we're pushing ahead on so many fronts to bring these things to a reality. Uh, So... Great news for the community here on the Falkland Islands, on Ascension Island, and in the UK. The news got people talking online, and the SAMS Facebook page lit up with some people claiming that this is the best news ever. The service will be paid for by the main employers on Ascension, and will start as soon as the RMS is decommissioned. For now though, we don't know the ticket prices, and there are a few other details still to be cleared up but the governments of both islands have promised that more information will come soon. Also at Bertrand's Cottage was a group of French VIPs who are on island to mark 200 years since Napoleon's exile to St. Helena. The emperor arrived at St. Helena on the 15th of October in 1815, after 10 weeks at sea aboard HMS Northumberland. Head of Enterprise St. Helena, Niall O'Keefe, unveiled plans to restore Bertrand's cottage to its former glory, while converting the ground floor into a fully functioning restaurant, with the top floor becoming a three-bedroom guest house. Um, According to this wonderful book, just being published by uh, Michel, um, Bertrand's cottage was first occupied 199 years ago this month. And I imagine the activities around that time were probably as intense as the activities on St. Helena at present, when we're preparing for bringing in tourists uh, by plane for the first time. Enterprise St. Helena is pleased to confirm today that Bertrand's Cottage will be converted into a guest house with public restroom facilities while sympathetically retaining its historic significance as a Regency period building linked to the Napoleonic period of the island. Also adding to this concept, is the intention for it to be used as a center of excellence for hospitality training and to, and to display items of furniture of significant historic value from their period. I'm, I'm going to invite Governor Cates to say a few words, but in advance of that, so to ensure that there aren't any delays with the refurbishment of the building, I'm going to ask you, Governor, to uh, pass the keys of Bertrand's Cottage to the successful uh, bidder, Isaac uh, Construction, and their representative, John Joshua, please. Tours of the existing building were conducted and guests had the opportunity to view the new floor plans for the proposed refurbishment. 
The French visitors attended a special ceremony of commemoration of Napoleon's exile to St. Tonina at the tomb on Sunday. Father Del Bowis led the commemoration with prayers. A minute silence followed Pastor Graham Beckett's rendition of Sonnery O More. The UK and French national anthems were sung by choirs, followed by laying of wreaths, led by His Excellency the Ambassador Jean Mendelssohn, representing the Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Development of the French Republic. Shelby Bargo, Jade Leo, and Teeny Lucy drew the ceremony to a close with a musical recital on strings before everyone was welcomed to the tomb site to mix with the French visitors. The St. Anina Museum is playing host to Anya O'Keefe's art exhibition, which is focused on St. Anina and particularly in connection to Napoleon. The exhibition, named 200 in tribute of the bicentenary of Napoleon's arrival on Ireland, displays 12 original paintings depicting scenes relating to the French Emperor. Honourable French Council Michel Martineau officially opened the intimate event on Friday the 9th of October where there were speeches by the artist and SAMS was there at the opening of the exhibition that will be running until the 23rd of October. Okay, now I'm here with uh, Anya O'Keefe. Um, Anya, these are fantastic artworks. So just explain to the, the, the viewers what, what we're doing here today. Well, we're opening uh, the exhibition that I've created called 200. Um, when I arrived in St. Helena over a year ago, Michel Deschanel-Martineau uh, uh, invited us to Longwood House, Briars and the Tomb, and he told us all about it. And I was fascinated by the history and, the, you know, just being here was, was amazing. And I, I asked him, can I take photographs? I'm an artist. Do, would you mind if I did some work around this? And he said, oh, he, his support was total and fantastic. And, uh, and then he agreed to open it for me a year later, which is amazing. Which would you say is your favourite? If you, if, you, if you could have a favourite, which would you say is your favourite? Pet, um, it's the one here, actually. This one. And uh, what, what's, just to describe what that, that pet photo depicts. It's um, an arrangement that Michel created, the honorary French consul. He created inside in Longwood House. Um, it's a replication of uh, Napoleon's coat and hat uh, resting on a chair. As the, uh, what it reminded me of is any human being who passes away and their clothes, still in their shape, are left there. And I think it just it, it was very human very atmospheric and very inspiring. So it's quite a tremendous turnout. What, what do you think about the turnout that you've had for the opening for the opening event? I'm a very emotional person as you can probably tell by my painting so I'm extremely moved that people took the time and were interested and I'm amazed. I'm absolutely amazed. I'm very honoured. Very honoured. Cancer Awareness Month kicked off last Friday afternoon. Over 500 people gathered at the seafront to view the Pull Together event organised by the Cancer Awareness Support Group. Seven teams endured an intense physical battle as they came together to pull a 16-ton fire appliance over a course of approximately 70 metres. That started, Richard. Basil Reed's super team were early front runners until Cunha's Ferries, a team put together by Martin Cunha Buckley, dethroned them. Martin was diagnosed with leukemia in 2006 and after seven courses of chemotherapy and a bone marrow transplant in 2009, he freed himself from the clutches of the deadly disease. Despite his team's best efforts, 
The event was eventually won by Tropical Reef Donkeys, a team made up of St. Helena Airport firefighters who just pipped Cunha's Furies by less than half a second. And the poll scooped prizes for being the team that showed the best team spirit and raised the most money. After the poll together at the seafront, the large crowds headed to the mule yard to witness four brave men have their body hair removed for charity. And in front of me are three brave souls. Stupid, but brave. Say pain! 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 For them! Uh, so, how are you feeling? Um, nervous? <laughs> but nothing to feel nervous about, Nigel. Nervous, but it's for a good cause. Yep. Have you had the first song before? Are you sure? Okay. I'm sure you can remember that. Oh, sorry, I thought that she was going to rip his nipple off. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Now. Oh! Oh! That was the first pull, ladies. Oh, actually. That uh, six months-ish. Wow. Oh, well done. Six months worth of hair, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Not bad at all. Okay. <laughs> no leaders in disbelief, ladies and gentlemen. You can't believe that someone is, uh, is crazy enough to wax a full eyebrow off. Now Lee hasn't done this before, ladies and gentlemen. It's a learning curve for everybody. Five, four, three, two, one. In the weeks leading up to the event, Nigel McMichael was able to raise over £1,000 before the night had even begun. The Cancer Support Awareness Group then combined with tourism to host a Regency ball at the castle on Saturday night. Those attending the ball were encouraged to dress in period style and it was pleasing to see a few done period customs. Bobby Goose and Jeffrey George performed an array of musical numbers and the dance floor was a hub of activity for the entire night. The Cancer Support Awareness Group has more events planned for the rest of the month, so watch this space. Here now though is Liam Young with a roundup of last weekend's footballing action. Cheers Damien. In Saturday's first game, Bell Boys continued on their run of form, beating the Fugees by 4 goals to 2. Fugees will feel disappointed after leading the scoreline by a goal to no through Jordan Young for the majority of the match. Inform striker Scott Crowey bagged himself yet another hat-trick for Bell Boys, with Tyler Brady also adding a single to the tally. Selwyn Stroud scored Fuji's second goal of the match. The battle for third place continued this weekend, with Chop Shop Boys and Wirebirds going head-to-head at 3.30pm. The Birds took the lead to Rip Joshua, before Chop Shop struck back to level the score from Kevin Hudson. The game was closely contested to the last, but a winning goal did not come. Wirebirds still hold the third place spot with a superior goal difference. On Sunday, Rovers maintained their position at the top of the table with a 2 0 win over Axis. Brian Sim and Andrew Young nodded for the reigning champs, 
who will need to win every match and hope for a slip up from the Hearts if they are to retain their league title. In Sunday's second match, Crystal Rangers made it two wins in a row after a dominating 7-2 victory over the Wolves. Nick Stevens and Cody Thomas got a brace each with other goals coming from Jordan Johnson, Somed and Russ Liu. Rico Coleman scored both goals for the Wolves. Here now is this week's feature game. In the weekend's final fixture, Hearts continued on their road to league glory with a convincing 6-1 win over Raiders. Hearts entered the game knowing that nothing but victories in their final games would see them lift the 2015 league trophy. The Blues started on the front foot, testing Raiders goalkeeper and candidate for keeper of the season, Rick Thomas. Despite being equal to most of the alley efforts, Rook could not stop Colin Young, who leapt onto a rebound for Hart's first goal of the game. The league was doubled soon after, with a composed finish from Jason George. With the adrenaline still pumping from this goal, Jason was on hand to dispatch a Chris Owen corner just minutes later. Despite going three goals down in ten minutes, Raiders kept calm and continued in search of a goal of their own. This sometimes left them vulnerable on the counter-attack with the pace of Jason up front. He should have scored again here, but unfortunately his touch was poor. It seemed his first half hat-trick just wasn't to be when just minutes later he was granted this gift of a corner from Carlin, only for his effort to bounce back off the upright. Hearts were unlucky not to get another goal before half-time, but again, keeper Rook, as he has done often this season, kept his team in it. The second half started as the first ended, with Hearts on the front foot. The fourth almost came after a dazzling run by Shane Stroud on the left wing, saw him pass two Raiders men, before trying a low shot on goal. Unlucky Shane. Hearts finally got that fourth goal near the hour mark. Chris Owen took his time before smashing a shot through the keeper's legs and, to the confusion of many spectators, through the net. Raiders were quick to react after going four down. This well witted pass from Captain Greg Phillips put Dane through on goal, where he made no mistake giving his team a glimmer of hope. Those hopes were diminished just minutes later though, when this mistake was made by the usually comfortable Rick in goal. <sighs> Hearts rounded off a good performance with the sixth and final goal of the game. Great tenacity from captain Mikey Williams gave Clayton Thomas space to whip in a left-footed cross. There was star man Jason George to head home his third goal of the game, completing a well-deserved hat-trick. Hearts will now look forward to next week's game against the Axis. After the weekend's results, Rovers still sit top of the table on 43 points. Hearts are two points behind with a game in hand. This means that is currently the Blues' title to lose. This week both Rovers and Hearts will have difficult matchups with Rovers taking on Wirebirds and Axis set to take on Hearts. This could be a very important game-changing weekend in this year's local football league. Back to you Damien. Thank you Liam. That brings us to the end of this week's edition of SAMS Newsbite. I'm Damien Obey. Thank you all for watching.